So uh, Lisette Sutherland is a German-born American living in the Netherlands who is totally fascinated by the fact that she can practically work from everywhere in the world. She runs a company called Collaboration Superpowers who helps people to um, work better remotely by providing online resources. Lisette will uh, talk uh, about how we can manage this new world we live in working in hybrid teams. And you as our guests will walk away with some interesting learnings about how to be present at work and how you can create a sense of a team even when you are virtual. So Lisette, the stage is yours. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. And um, I'm also getting, oh, I got a little echo, but I think it's good now. And uh, indeed, as you can hear, I'm American. I was born in Germany. I was born in Frankfurt, uh, but I am now living in the Netherlands for the last 12 years. And I'll just say just in the last week, I got my Dutch passport. So hooray, I'm actually officially European now. Super excited about it. And I'm, so, I'm honored to be here today to talk a bit about um, how we are going to be navigating this new normal, shall we say, and how to work in a uh, hybrid teams in an agile way. Because as we all know, COVID sent us all home to work in March. And a lot of people who doubted whether remote working was actually possible saw that when necessary, it was possible to work together anywhere. And just to mention really quick, uh, I see a couple of people have already found out. I am going to be doing a couple of poll questions throughout, but we'll get to that. I just wanted to warn people in advance so you can get your devices ready. So we are, it is possible to work together anywhere, and it has been a rough ride, right? As we've all discovered that working at home during a pandemic is not the normal way of remote working. And I must say that I am an experienced remote worker. I've been doing this for a very long time, and even I experienced significant stress and disruption. And I can't even imagine what it must have been like for parents, right? As we're doing online schooling and navigating the, ver the various rules of lockdown, there's been a lot of fodder for a bumpy ride, but many of us did it. And as we smoothed out the bumps, we began to realize that in some, it, excuse me, in some instances, it wasn't just possible to work remotely, it was actually preferable. So now, as the lockdowns are being lifted, some people don't want to go back to the office even when it's safe to do so. They don't miss the commute, They don't miss the office politics. They're maybe more productive at home. And they like the freedom that remote work offers. So in terms of this group, what I'm very curious about is when it's safe to do so, what is it that you would like? Would you like to go back to the office 100%, work remote 100%, or be hybrid, which is some combination of remote and office work? And if there's something else, um, you can add it to the chat. However, I can't see the chat, so we'll have to. <laughs> so it'll be for the participants view only. And uh, again, we're at slido.com, and the code is 1224, and I'll show the results here on the screen in real time. So we don't have too many results yet, just 12 people responding. But as we can see, there is so far a clear choice. So uh, right now, most people want to be hybrid. I'll give just a couple more seconds for people to, uh, to get there. And then keep your finger on that Slido uh, button because we'll be doing a couple more questions as we go. All right. So this doesn't surprise me at all. I have been doing this question in presentations for the last few months, and uh, the results are almost exactly the same everywhere I go, all over the world, virtually, of course. And that is the vast majority of people want to work in this hybrid way, where we're some days at the office and some days remote. And A lot of times we'll see on social media where people are saying, hey, the future of work is remote. It's remote. And actually, I think the future of work is choice uh, it, because most people don't want to leave the office behind entirely. I know my husband in particular hates working from home. Oh, and I want to go back to my slides. And uh, and. In the end, I think that really what people want is the freedom to choose when and where they're most productive. 
So another thing that I'd like to say that it's not just about the freedom of the worker. It's actually, or it's not about just that the individuals get to choose, but companies get to choose as well, right? There's a number of companies that don't want to necessarily be remote when the lockdowns end. And I think that that's perfectly fine. Everybody gets the choice to work when and where they, they want. And there is a scale about how remote we want to be. So you can see there's everything from 100% office-based. The next level would be we're office-based with the work from home home uh, option. The next one is we're a remote team in one time zone, and then you're a remote team in different time zones, and then you've got moving parts with a distributed team. So it really depends on how remote your company wants to be, and that's how we should set ourselves up to work in the future. And I've always said for years, anybody that's attended my presentations years ago will know that I've always said that it's important for companies that no matter where you are in the scale, that you want to be remote first, which just means that regardless of where you are, you have the processes and systems in place to be able to be remote in case the situation arises. In the past, I used uh, examples like bad weather or your kids are sick at home. Uh, I never expected a global pandemic, but here we are. And all of a sudden, being remote first has become imperative for company survival. So now is really the time to set ourselves up to succeed. I mean, we're you know we're all sort of surviving this year, um, but you know now we're really noticing that this is going to be here for a while. So I just want to mention that all of the tips and uh, tools that I'm going to be showing you in today's presentation come from the uh, almost 270 interviews that I've done over the last six years with remote teams. And you can find all of those interviews for free on my website. They're in video and podcast form. And then I just recently published my book, Work Together Anywhere, that has all of the tips and everything all consolidated into one book. And I just wanted to make the offer that uh, if you're interested, I've got a remote working success kit on my website. And if you download the success kit during this presentation, I'm going to pick one person and send you a free copy of the book. You can have ebook or paperback. So if you just go to collaborationsuperpowers.com slash superkit, if you download the kit during this presentation, right afterwards, I'm going to go and choose somebody at random and I'll send the book to you. Plus you get a whole bunch of great resources. So the one thing that I've learned from all the interviews is that there is no one right way to work remotely, sadly. It's a matter of putting, experimenting and seeing what works for you because what works for one team doesn't necessarily work for another. But when we get it right, the payoff is huge. We as individuals get the freedom to work when and where we're most productive, and our companies get a stronger and more connected workforce that isn't dependent on location. And I just wanted to give one example because this was such a really good interview that I did a few years ago. Um, and I just wanted to give it because it's a good proof of concept that remote is actually, uh, it is possible uh, and we can, we can succeed. And so this is the story of Hyperloop, the Hyperloop team. And a few years ago, SpaceX announced a competition to design a Hyperloop pod, which is a super fast transportation system, oops, I was on this side, um, that can squeeze a commute from seven hours into 30 minutes minutes. And you're basically just getting shot through a gravity tube. I would totally not want to be the beta tester for this, but uh, I think it's a pretty cool initiative, as are most ones from Elon Musk. Someone on the online platform Reddit wanted to join this competition and asked out into the group, is there anybody there that wants to do this with me? Now, one year later, with a team of almost 400 remote volunteers from all over the world, they came in finalists in this competition. So it just goes to show that complex global projects are possible with remote teams. And I like to show this example because, in particular because they were using volunteers. It wasn't even paid workers. So a uh, great interview. Highly recommended. It's number 83 uh, if you want to go on the website and check it out. So now, while I said that there is no one right way, I do think that there are three areas of focus where if we put our energies here, we increase the likelihood of our success. And those are, we want to work out loud and define normal behavior. We want to modify how we're communicating with each other online. And we need to be deliberate about team building. And all of those things sound pretty simple, but we'll dive into the details there because really the devil's in the details. So let's start with, working out loud and defining normal behavior. And what I mean by working out loud is, how do we make our work observable to others in a way that's meaningful? So the first way, of course, is when we're remote, 
we really need to organize and visualize our work. So most people are, especially software teams, have already been doing this. You know, there's all kinds of tools out there like Trello and Asana and Jira and Basecamp and hundreds actually of tools. But it is really important that we organize and visualize what we're working on. Now, not only do we, can we visualize our work, we can actually visualize ourselves and go to work in a new way. One of those ways is by actually going to work in a virtual office. And uh, right now I'm actually also in this Wilo space. So this is Wilo, it's a virtual office. You can see here that there are individual rooms you can only see and hear the people that are in the same room as you, but you can double click and go anywhere on the virtual floor plan to go talk and be with other people. So when I go to work every day in the morning, I start up my computer like everybody else, and then I start up my browser and I enter my virtual office with my colleagues there and I spend the day with my colleagues. Um, so this is a, can be a great way of creating presence online. These virtual offices have been around for a long time now, probably between five and 10 years, uh, but now they're getting really sophisticated and really fast. So I definitely recommend checking those out. The other part of visualizing our work though, is we, want, we need to visualize our ideas with each other. And one of the key skills that I think is important for remote work is learning how to use virtual whiteboards. There's Again, hundreds of virtual whiteboarding tools. The cool kids on the block right now are Jamboards and Miro and Mural. So definitely spend some time get learning how to use your virtual whiteboard because especially when we're going across cultures and across languages, visualizing our ideas with each other becomes increasingly important. Now, I want to show you a very a fancy uh, virtual whiteboard as well. This one's uh, from a company called Nareva. It's a whiteboard that is actually beamed onto your wall, and then you can draw things, add sticky notes, put in videos, and people can access it from any device. So this can become a powerful tool for hybrid collaboration, where some people are in the office and some people are in another location. Um, so, you know, if you thought like, oh, what I'm really missing with remote work is virtual whiteboarding, there are solutions out there and they're getting really, really good and the cost is coming down. So I just want to mention, like I had said before, uh, there are hundreds of tools out there that enable remote working. And so I invite you to check out my website. I've got a list of hundreds of tools there. But being a tool junkie myself, before I continue the presentation, I would like to say, excuse me, it's not about the tool. It's about the behavior that the tool enables. So before you go jumping in and seeing what shiny new objects are out there, think about what is it that you're actually trying to accomplish and then look for the tool that helps you do that. Because there's a shiny object for everything, but what we're really trying to do um, is, is uh, behave in a certain way. So speaking of behavior, one of the ways that we work out loud and define normal is we actually talk about what are the expectations? What does success look like? What does failure look like? And making sure that that is really clear on our teams. One of the easiest ways of doing that is by creating a team agreement together that just outlines what is normal behavior for your team, especially when we're remote. So you would never get a sports team together and say, all right, just go play. And you'd never get an orchestra together and say the same thing. You'd always tune and practice to become a high performing team. The same thing is true with remote. So uh, at Evernote, this is the uh, CEO of Evernote. Um, and when I interviewed him or the head of EMEA, excuse me, when I interviewed him, he says that at Evernote, they really define what behavior do they expect from people in meetings? What kind of email rules are there? calendaring rules, what's expected in their home office, and they just go through and define what is normal for their team. Um, and it helps give sort of a platform for our ways of working. One of the great quotes that he said uh, in this interview was, you would never email the fire department if your house is on fire, right? It's the wrong medium of communication. And the same is true with remote. You really want to define, uh, you know, if it's on a weekend, what's the best way to get in touch with somebody if you really need to? Do you send a WhatsApp? Do you send a Slack? What's an email? Do you actually make a phone call? How are you going to communicate with each other? 
So to go quickly to our next uh, question, what I'd like to ask of the group is, do you have a team agreement in place right now? Any kind. So I don't mean any kind. I mean a written agreement somewhere. So not just a verbal agreement. Do you have something written down with your team for, you know, what kind of information you're going to share? Uh, how do you know what people are doing? Do you have core hours together? Let's see where we're at because this answer has been changing over time. I'll go ahead and show the results in real time while we're waiting for them to come in. So far, with only four people responding, it's 50-50, so it's not a great big sample size. Again, we're at slido.com, code 1224. And these results so far are not unusual. It's got about 60 people responding, almost 70 people, yep. So don't despair. Most people don't have a team agreement in place. Again, these numbers match what I've been seeing, although team agreements are becoming more and more popular as COVID, as we go more and more into COVID. Um, so what I will offer you is I've got some free templates available on the website that you can download and use to create team agreements. So if you've never done it before, there's a video and a podcast and some uh, Word documents that you can download just or PDFs to download just to, so you don't have to do it alone. It gives you some of the questions that you can prompt your team with. It doesn't matter the type, what you use to create your team agreement. There's several different options on the site. The, what matters is just having that conversation. You'll get rid of a lot of the basic misunderstandings. All right, so that's pretty standard, right? We want to work out loud and define what is normal for our team. But now we need to figure out how do we modify how we communicate when we go online. When the lockdown started, most companies tried to mimic the office online somehow, and what it resulted in was endless online meetings, right? We started to hear about Zoom fatigue, and my neighbors were complaining about these three-hour conference calls they were having to sit through without a break. Um, and so, you know, we're starting to get into meeting overload. So now for my last question on the poll questions of the day, I'd like to know from you guys, how many hours a week are you spending in meetings right now? Is it zero to two, two to five, five to 10? Have you lost track completely? Let's see where, we, where we're at with this group. How many hours a week are you spending in meetings right now? And I will show the results again in real time. Oh no, we've got uh, <laughs> the wrong categories are winning. <laughs> we've got 20 plus hours a week uh, in number one category and then uh, 10 to 20 in the next category. Oh, this is a lot of meetings guys and gals. So I'll wait for just another minute for more results to come in. Indeed. So, so I think we're, we're seeing here, it's confirmed. We're spending way too much time in meetings. Have I got some tips for you? So what we're realizing, of course, is that some things don't translate well online. Remote working is a different medium of work than in-person work, and we need to start thinking of it like that. I like to make the analogy between radio and television. They're both broadcasting mediums, but you design content for each of those mediums differently. The same is true for remote and in-person. They're both work mediums, but we certainly need to design things differently because what we're doing now is not, not sustainable. You know, when we're remote, we have to express ourselves differently. We show appreciation differently. We build trust in a different way. And the structure of our workday changes. And one of the keys to this new remote medium is being more conscientious about how we use our time. A super easy place to start is by taking your meetings and shortening them. So if it's 30 minutes, shorten it to 25 minutes, take a five minute break. If it's an hour, shorten it to 45 or 50 minutes and take a 10 to 15 minute break. Um, that's sort of the low hanging fruit. And I wanna just say one thing about these breaks. What most companies are contacting me about right now is not techniques for better remote working, but it is instead about mental health and well-being, because it turns out we're spending way too much time in 2D. So, right, we're going in our meetings, we're talking on Zoom, and then we're getting out of the meeting, we're checking email or maybe social media, and we're going back into meetings, or then we're doing something working online, and we got off work, and then we're on Netflix and YouTube, and it turns out that we're just getting way too much screen time. So, one of the most important things that we're 
we're seeing right now is we really need to take more breaks that involve movement and whenever possible, get outside. Even if it's just stretching on your balcony, it is way better than checking your social media uh, inside without doing any movement. And one of the things that I've started doing in the this last couple of months is just during my breaks, I won't let myself touch my phone or my computer and you're just bound to move because if otherwise you're just standing there staring at the wall. Um, so I would say put your phones away during your breaks and really take a break. Uh, it will improve the mental health considerably. Now, the next step is then to evaluate if you actually need that meeting to begin with, or can the conversation be done asynchronously? So for example, if it's a status update, maybe it can be just posted in a Slack channel or in a tool like I've done this, there's tons of tools for these kind of things. Or if somebody is preparing a presentation to give during a meeting, why not record that presentation before the meeting starts, and then use your valuable time online for discussions and decision making. Or instead of brainstorming together in a meeting, you know, have everybody brainstorm before the meeting starts on their own time, and then again, using your valuable online time together for discussions and decision making. Getting better at asynchronous communication means less interruptions and more control over our day. And it also gives everybody a chance to sort of process information instead of just going with knee-jerk reactions that tend to happen in time-boxed meetings. So I've got this yin-yang symbol over underneath the question mark because the ratio of asynchronous and synchronous work varies for every company. And the key question just to ask yourself is, what ratio do you need? And to let people know, there are companies out there that are 100% asynchronous. And that means they never speak, they never see each other, they do everything through chat and ticketing systems and video, um, and they just never speak synchronously online. So it does exist. It's unusual, it's not very common, uh, but it is out there. So synchronous and asynchronous, it exists on a scale, and we need to figure out for our companies and ourselves what works best for us. So the idea is we want to reduce the number of meetings that we need, and then we want to improve the meetings that we're having. One of my favorite quotes from the interviews that I did came from Agile Bill Krebs, and he said, people think they want to be co-located, but what we really want is high bandwidth communication, right? We want to be able to talk to our remote colleagues as if they were in the office with us. And I like to make the analogy between Star Trek, right? You have that communicator on your chest. You want to just be like, well, set to bridge, report. And then from anywhere on the ship, I get a report. And there's no coffee shop sounds or um, screaming children in the background. It's just crystal clear communication. We also want to make it easy to go from asynchronous to synchronous modes, right? So uh, to, to just be talking in a conversation and think this is getting too complicated, let's hop on a call together. Um, so we really just want to make that transition easier. Now, what it, one thing I want to say is um, in terms of uh, having high bandwidth communication, one of the important things that's happening with remote is we want to turn the videos on in general. There's always situations where it's not appropriate, of course, but if your uh, not appropriate reason is, oh, it's just not a good hair day or I want, I'm in my pajamas, um, well, we have to be professional. We are professional, so I would say get a big headset like I've done and that uh, hides all the hair that uh, from the haircuts that I haven't had, um, you know, and put on a nice shirt. That's all you really need for the, for the online world, but I'll show you an example of um, when we don't use video, and I can just hide myself completely here. When we don't use video, you can see that there's an immediate drop in engagement when you can't see somebody. It's now just you know slides and a voice. And when I put myself back on, um, that you can feel the engagement going up because seeing each other just helps increase engagement. And if you're wondering what kind of tool I'm using, it's a brand new tool called mm -hmm. So M-M-H-M-M, -M -M, that's the tool that this is uh, for those people that are curious about that. So one of the things that we really need to do is for hybrid working is we need to improve our infrastructure. So that means as individuals, we need to have a good infrastructure where wherever we're working at home these days. So um, having good lighting, a webcam, a headset, a very good internet connection is usually the baseline of remote work. But then our offices need to change as well. 
If you have some of these old style conference rooms uh, in your office, these are going to need to get upgraded to help include remote workers more. So this is the old spider phone that sits in the middle of the table, right, where you're leaning over like, hey, Bob, it's Lisette. Can you hear me? And in this situation, the remote participants are like mosquitoes in the room. You can hear them. You kind of know they're around, but uh, you really wish they weren't. What we want to do is move some to something more like this, where the remote participants are present, they're almost life-size, and the in-person participants are facing them so that there's more interaction and more engagement together. And then, again, there are lots of tools out there to help accommodate uh, this type of hybrid working. One of the ones that people are raving about these days is Meeting Owl. It's a 360-degree microphone and camera that sits in the middle of the table. It allows the remote participant to see everybody in the room, and then it will auto-focus on the person that's speaking so that you really get a sense of everybody who's there and the person that's speaking. So, And it looks really cute. It looks like a little owl. So that's, uh, that's always fun. So these kind of tools can really help increase the engagement. And going to this hybrid way of working, it is admittedly the most difficult kind of working. When we're all remote, it's one thing. When we're all in person, it's one thing. But when we go hybrid, it starts to get exponentially more complicated. So the better that we can set up our setup so that we can go from asynchronous to synchronous as quickly as we can, um, the better that it will be for our teams. Now, I'm going to take you a couple of steps into the far out just to show you where the industry is headed. Um, so I've already shown you virtual offices. The next thing would be telepresence, which basically are just drivable robots that you can beam into just like Skype or Microsoft Teams these days or Zoom or Google Meets, except for now you can drive yourself using the arrow keys of your keyboard. So if your office has a lot of stairs or a swimming pool or elevators, this is not the tool for you. But if you have a big, long, wide open space, then these kind of tools can really increase engagement. And at the Suitable Technologies office in, tech, uh, in San Francisco, they actually have 50% of their workforce that are in the flesh, they call it, and 50% that beam in via robot. And uh, it really works. It's only weird at first until you get used to it, and that's not that weird anymore. And then to take another step uh, far out into the weird, uh, Virtual reality technology uh, has come a long way in the last few years. And I would just say that if you've got an Oculus Quest that I can highly recommend trying out one of the major uh, meeting technologies uh, apps in Oculus Quest. So this one's called Meet in VR. It's one of my favorites. From putting on the Oculus Quest to sitting at a meeting with other people takes about five minutes. It's that easy. And then you're sitting at a table with others. You can hear who's to the right and the left of you. You can pull up a whiteboard and start drawing on it and other people can contribute and save it from there. So a lot of us are still struggling with those old spider phones, but just know that teams that can, uh, that can master these kind of technologies are really going to have superpowers in the future. But the idea is, regardless of the technologies that we're using, we need to reduce the number of meetings that we need and then improve the ones that you're having. And if you're really having trouble with your online facilitation skills or you want to dive into how to do that better, I would recommend getting some training for your team. Uh, remember, remote work is a new medium of work. And if your teams are struggling, then get them the training that they need for this new skill in the modern day. So now we've talked about working out loud. We've talked about how we modify, how we need to modify how we communicate with each other. And I want to just end by very quickly talking a little bit about team building. And I have to say, I know it's really hard right now because we can't really be together as a team. And it's like, you know, it's just impossible. So uh, you know, I would always recommend getting together in person on a regular basis, but at the moment, you know, we're just not there. We're in a pandemic. So what we need to do is schedule our serendipity together in terms of team building. So I would just set up regular virtual coffees, you know, quiz nights, virtual lunches, just touch points where the team can get together and hang out. Um, I worked at a company once where we just had a virtual lunch every Wednesday at noon. Whoever was there would just show up. We'd have lunch together, and the only rule was we were not allowed to talk about work. It was just playtime. Um, and that was just a regular occurrence that happened every week. But it does need to be scheduled, and there's, there does need to be a cheerleader 
in terms of keeping it going and keeping the momentum going. Uh, one of the new roles that seems to be popping up in the remote world is this whole remote office manager role, somebody who schedules these kind of meetings and just to make sure that they're happening. Because if you leave it to chance, chances are they don't happen. Um, so we really do need to be deliberate about making these touch points. And then the other thing that I would say is, remember that you can play games together online. And it's actually very simple. This is a, a game of Pictionary that people played. You can already tend to guess. I think this right here is clearly a, a banana, uh, the one in the middle. But you know, even with a few lines, you can play Pictionary for five minutes at the beginning or end of every meeting. It always brings a smile to people's faces and you're learning how to use virtual whiteboards at the same time. So it has a double fun, double function there. Now, I have an, a huge list of team building activities that is available on the website, of, of course. Uh, there's also a PDF that you can download there. Uh, since the corona times, it has gotten very creative online. You can do museum tours online. Um, there's all kinds of games to be played from uh, speed, speed typing to board games to video games, all kinds of things. So just check that out for inspiration, especially now around the holidays. And then the last thing that I would add to this is just make sure these days to check in with each other, especially as we're coming towards December. It has been a really rough year, and I, can, I probably can say for everybody, it has been a rough year for everybody in various ways. So, uh, you know, if, if you're noticing that somebody is not, uh, is just not 100%, definitely check in and just see how people are doing. So just as a reminder that I think everybody's very tired at the end of this year. We're all sort of crawling towards the holidays. Um, make sure to take rest and to uh, practice really good self-care during these times. It's critically important. So just to recap, the future of work is choice. Whether you want to be remote or hybrid or in an office, I believe that the, the way that the future is going is the ability for all of us to choose. And it's not just the individuals that get to choose. It is companies that get to choose as well. And so now is the time to set ourselves up to succeed. And Again, there is no one right way, no silver bullet formula. I wish there were. I would have sold it and made a million dollars during COVID. There's no one right way to work remote. What works for one team doesn't necessarily work for another. So we need to experiment and figure out what works for us. And when we get it right, the payoff is huge. We get the freedom to work when and where we're most productive, which also gives us the freedom to design our lifestyles around the things that we're most passionate about. And our companies get a stronger and more connected workforce that is not dependent on location. Now, remember, it's a journey. You don't get it right on the first try, and the goal is just to be better, be better tomorrow than we were today, right? There is sort of no end point or perfection. It's just how can we be better tomorrow than we were today? So just one last reminder of downloading the Remote Working Success Kit. You can go to collaborationsuperpowers.com slash superkit, and I'll pick one person to send a free copy of the book to. If you don't get chosen, but you'd still like a copy of the book, uh, you can get the book online, lisettesutherland.com, and there is a code WTA30 that you can use for a discount that comes from my editors. And then one last thing I'd like to let people know about is that in a couple of weeks, on the 16th of December, a group of my facilitators have gotten together to offer something called the Workshop Extravaganza. So there are 10 workshops that are going to be offered. You get to choose two. They're just two short workshops, and you can just try things out and see what great online facilitation looks like. So with that, I will end the presentation today and just thank you for your engaged attention and to the answers that you submitted on Slido. Thank you so much for that. And I think, uh, Katie, there's some Q&A that is happening. I don't know how much time we have left. <laughs> okay, I think Katerina um, doesn't yet know that she can uh, talk. Um, ah, hi. <laughs> 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 okay, so hi, I'm in. I, I didn't notice that I'm in. So, uh, Lisette, thanks a lot for your very interesting talk. Um, you gave a lot of nice advices, hints. Um, there were a few questions um, about all the tools you mentioned. And um, I remember you noticed that they are all listed on your website. 
Uh, is this correct? Perfectly. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I tried to catch up all the questions that came up from the audience. Um, <laughs> as it is in remote meetings, of course, it's yeah, like a bit uh, struggling as um, I uh, had a lot of tools open, but I, I tried to um, address all these questions to you. So let me start with a question that came up from Slido because there was a Q&A uh, section as well. Sure. Um, there was one question, it was anonymous, but uh, the question is, why being agile, many people dislike to have rules for everything. How do you handle that and encourage, um, for example, teams agreements? So do you have any advices on this? Well, indeed, I, I don't like to think of them as rules on the team agreement. What I like to think of is just describing how we work together. So they're not rules. They're just guidelines. Like for some teams, you need to have core hours. Uh, otherwise, you know, like because you need to have that overlap time together. So maybe just outlining, hey, these are the core hours where we're expecting people. Or one of the things that's on my team agreement with my team is um, – that there, nobody is expected to answer emails or do any sort of work in the evenings and on the weekends. And my team knows that on Saturday mornings, that's my time for when, you know, the weeks are so busy that Saturday morning for just two hours, I sit down and I answer all the emails and I kind of catch up on things that I didn't get to, but they're not at all required to respond. They just know that Saturday morning is the time that I'm doing. So that's in our team agreement. So I would say I get that you don't want any more rules, especially as agile teams. You've got a lot of structure and rules already, but I would say that um, the team agreement is less about rules and more about just describing how you work together so that everybody's on the same page. Um, awesome. Um, I remember you already uh, mentioned like coffee talks and meetings that you um, have like dailies for your team. Um, is this something that you would recommend for those rules as well? Like we have a special time during the day where the team meets and um, ask all the questions that uh, they need for their daily work. So this could be one solution for these rules. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Where you just describe like, hey, every Wednesday at noon, we have a virtual lunch. Come on by if you if you feel like it's there. The team agreement, one, one of the things that's great for is that if somebody new comes on your team, you can just send them the team agreement and they can slide right into how you're working without having to ask a bunch of questions and figure it out. You know, because we're when we're at the office, we get a lot of visual cues for how to work. We know where the files are. We know when people break for lunch and when people arrive. But when we're remote, all bets are off. Everybody has different working styles. I think we're all discovering that we have different working hours. Like I know my husband is uh, a morning person, and he is like up and out of the house faster than I can have a cup of coffee. I'm just <laughs> not functional in the morning. So, you know, if, if my core hours were going to be at 7 a.m., then I would need to do something about that. So, you know, it's just it's just figuring out how we work together. So I'd, I wouldn't think of them as rules. They're agreements. They're like, okay. Yeah. yeah. Sounds better. Agreement sounds sounds yeah, better. Yeah. More agile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, another question from the audience um, is spending a lot of time in meetings, uh, gener uh, bad in generally, or do you think it depends on the topic and uh, the things that needs to be discussed? I don't think that spending time in meetings is bad in general. I mean, because I would say like most of my week is spent in meetings with other people. I'm a solopreneur. I've got to have sales calls and like, there's all kinds of things that are happening. But what I would say is that the screen time is not healthy. And unless we're really careful about how we're using our screen time, uh, that there are some negative mental uh, health repercussions that come from that. And, you know, if you're in your 20s and you're not feeling them now, just wait. 20 years, you will feel them eventually. Um, it does catch up to you. Uh, but just to just to be just to recognize that it is actually an issue. It's not just a thing that when you do when you think you're feeling fatigued because you've been on the screen for too long, it's it's a real thing. Um, so no, it's not that meetings are bad uh, if you're having good meetings, but I think we're just spending way too much time in 2D. Um, depending on this, do you think that employees should take more care of home office setups? So like, do they have good light? So as you can see, I do not have good light in my remote office yet. <laughs> uh, so do they, do they have good light, uh, high quality microphones, um, ergonomic chairs and desks? Uh, so do you think that's like part of the employees to take care of it? 
you know, it's really, it's different because it, in different areas of the world, the employer is responsible for some things and the employer is responsible. So it, it really depends on the country that you're in. But I would just say mm -hmm. in general, if you're going to be working from home uh, for the foreseeable future, you're going to want to make yourself comfortable. So if you're camped out at your kitchen table right now, you may need to reconsider, uh, you know, what equipment that you have. Maybe you need to have a standing desk, uh, something that helps you stand more or a better microphone or maybe better lighting. Uh, you know, it just depends. But I would say, you know, camping is fun, but not for too long. So if you find yourself camped out in your house somewhere, uh, I would say if you have the luxury and the, the finances, make yourself comfortable. Uh, we're going to be here a while. And winter yeah, is coming. So, <laughs> let me yeah. jump in. Um, and I, I loved your mosquito um, metaphor because we are kind of the mosquito here. Uh, you and Kati have been talking for a while now, and I've been searching for the right point to get into the discussion. <laughs> and probably, I don't know, um, there was no way for me um, to do that in a decent way. Do you have a suggestion for people who are those mosquitoes um, and who, I don't know, maybe they were on the restroom or they had their kid and had to tend them and then after 15 minutes they come back and they have to crunchy brood something and it's important to do that like in the situation. How do I get into the meeting so that other people know that I want to say something? I was, there's a couple of things. One is uh, hopefully you've got a good meeting facilitator, somebody who who can who will make sure that the remote participants are being seen and heard, um, so that they're giving equal time to both sides. Um, and the other is what I've seen people do is have a like a Sherpa or a, a buddy for the remote participants, so that somebody like for you know for instance like Peter would be my buddy, and he and I would mm -hmm. indicate to him like, hey, I'd really like to talk, and then Peter would help me butt in. And, you know, because it's hard as a remote participant to just jump in and say something. So really good online facilitation skills, using the chat to say like, hey, I'd like to say something, having a buddy there that helps. Uh, it's not it's always going to be difficult, especially in hybrid. When you're together in person, it's so powerful. And with the remote part, I mean, as you as you're seeing, like with us being remote, it's totally different. It's not it's not the same as us all being there. And we have to work extra hard at communicating. That's why the, the equipment is so important, right? You want to be able to easily see and hear each other. And if you're a person like me, you interrupt and interrupt people a lot. That's even more intrusive in a remote environment, in my opinion. So you have to be very patient to wait until the other people are done. Yeah, I like and the, I would say keep, keep your meetings small, too. Yeah, I like the... Um, as at the conference it's called Tools for Agile Teams, like most tools like um, uh, Zoom or Google Meet, they have a, an, a facility to raise your hand and say, I want to say something. So if you have this buddy or facilitator, um, they can use this sign to make sure that you get your, your air where you can talk. Um, and I would also say just use visual cues, like for instance, maybe like this one says great idea, but maybe it says I want to speak, you know, you just hold up a sticky note saying I have something to say. Um, so you could do it virtually, but also just use your, that's why video is important, you know, so you want to be able to see like, oh, I, hey, I've got something to say, even just raising your hand the old fashioned way, <laughs> like in school. Yeah. Another question that I had from your talk, um, you have a, a couple of templates on your website and uh, for remote work. So when I check this out, um, what is your suggestion? Should I use your template and then adapt it? Or should I look at your template, try to learn from it, get inspired from it, and then sc start from scratch? Let's say uh, we can talk about this because mm. Adil is creating a software that is doing templates yeah. uh, within Confluence. And I'm uh, always thinking about, I'm, I'm the, the starting from st scratch guy, but um, I would uh, like to know from you whether you would recommend to work with your templates or just use them as an inspiration? No, they're totally just for inspiration. Uh, I really believe there is no one right way to create a, a team agreement. You can use a canvas, you can use questions, you can, you know, whatever tool for brainstorming and sticky notes. And it, the, what's really important about the team agreement is just having the conversation with your team. So if you have no idea where to start, use the templates that I've got for inspiration. If you, you know, if you're really lost, just start with the template. You'll quickly evolve into your own method. 
Yeah, okay. That so was kind I, of I, it I would understand answer. it as best practice too. <laughs> okay. But the question I would have, uh, that what I'm interested in, um, you are working with a lot of different teams, Lizette, as I understand. Is there a different meeting culture, remote, uh, like remote meeting culture, from people all over the world? Because uh, I'm noticing when I talk to people from the US, they are way more chatty than people here from Germany. They ask me how I am, how the weather is, where I'm calling from. While when, it's in, when we are in Germany, it's straight business. So do we have this similar experiences? Yeah, there, there, is, there are some, some cultural differences. Uh, the way that I usually get around that is I start with an icebreaker question. And immediately we all think of like silly icebreaker questions, you know, like, you know, what, what's on your feet right now or so is something on your desk. But actually there are some liberating structures techniques that can also be used uh, to bring people here. So like you could start the meeting by saying, why, uh, why are you here? What are you, what are you hoping to achieve in this meeting? What expertise are you bringing to the table? You know, a professional start to get everybody speaking. So, uh, you know, Americans, we can be really good at the chit chat, like the small talk. I don't know where we all learn it. And it's not, I don't remember the grade school class that I took, but, uh, <laughs> but I definitely got it. But, uh, uh, but in order to make people comfort, comfortable i always start with the icebreaker and that is because one it's a tech check so that i'm sure everybody can be seen and heard and then the other is that science shows that when people have spoken once in a meeting they're more likely to speak up again and so what i'm it's an engagement hack and so what i'm hacking there is um for people the comfort of people to to speak up again and then i would say that you know online facilitation skills me online meeting facilitation skills are going to be crucial because in person, we can kind of be sloppy with our meetings. You know, if you don't have an agenda, we'll get through it and uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. And it's not as tiring if we go a little bit over time. Remote, we can't, it, it becomes a disaster. So we really, it's like painting a room, right? With remote, you really have to prep the room and put the, the tape down and all the stuff. And then the meeting is just the painting. It's, it should be super easy at that point. So yeah, different techniques that need to be used. Okay. So actually now I've had like, the mosquito. Oh, is Lisette still speaking? I see. Yeah, I can. Ah, sorry. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, so actually now I felt like the mosquito and uh, <laughs> it was difficult to find the place to jump in because um, there uh, are some more questions from the audience that I would like to address to you. There was one question. Um, so uh, wouldn't you recommend to create a co-location feeling by keeping the camera uh, on during the full workday? So I, get, uh, I guess you stated something like you would not recommend doing this for a team, but it's the question. So how would you handle like team working? Is it a good idea to have a camera um, on the whole day to, to, to work with your team? I mean, it depends on the people. I would find it personally exhausting to have my camera on all day and to see like and to see the movement all the time because it just is a little bit distracting to just see movement. What I really prefer is like the virtual offices where you can see that people mm -hmm. are there and their avatars are there. Um, but you don't see all the flickering and the and the distracting stuff. Um, so I would say, You know, I used to do this. I used to have virtual co-working sessions with a woman in California. In fact, we worked together for 10 years until until this January. And uh, and we would just hang out together in the evenings. We would start with the camera on and just say hello and do our girl talk. And then after 10 minutes, we would turn the cameras off, continue to work. And at the end, we would turn them on again. But we had, so we had the cameras off and the sound on so that I could still hear her and we could hear each other typing and I could be like, hey, Gretchen, could you just help me out with this one thing? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really struggling. So I really encourage those kind of sessions uh, and it de the length will just depend on the person. Extroverted people can do it all day. Introverted people, not as much because if, if like I've got my co virtual co-working office open right now and it feels like people are there and at the end of the day, I'm exhausted and I've just been sitting here in my home office. So. Yeah, I, you know, everybody's different. If you like the camera on, go for it. But I would say try virtual co-working in many different forms. It's it's a lot of fun. It gets rid of the loneliness that a lot of us are feeling with that social contact. Um, and it's nice to have people around. Yeah, that's it. So you are using um, Velo. I guess it was the software you were, you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so you're using this with your team? 
Or yes. is it another software you're using? No, I'm using Wheelo Space now. I, admittedly, okay. I've been uh, I've I've known the CEO for years, and I was the first space that they created. So I'm I'm one of the first. <laughs> it's a brand new tool. It's only been out in the cool. last month, but there's 20 different virtual offices out there. There's you know uh, Hopin is a type. It's more for conferences, but like Sococo, Remo, work, Walkabout Workplace. There's a ton to try. Wheelo is my favorite, but that, I've that's also for, heard that's about just uh, Sococo a lot. Um, one yeah. thing that I wanted to add uh, to this uh, kind of always on meeting style video conference. Um, first of all, I see this with our teams a lot. So a lot of our development teams do this. I personally are, are not using this at all because um, if I'm in a meeting or such a situation, mm -hmm. it feels like you're always on surveillance. And I miss the points when I need to go to the restroom, I miss the points when I normally would make a break. Um, and when a situation of relaxation comes, I often end up having a headache, finding out that I drank too little, that I didn't eat. Um, and it's at least my recommendation for people would be uh, watch yourself and your behavior. And if you find out that you're like me, then you're probably incompatible to a eight hour long mm -hmm. video conference the whole day. And you'll I think most people are out. incompatible for that. <laughs> for that. But, but your, your point is really well taken because one of the things that I've had to do is I've had to actually write down for myself what are my personal stress signals. Like it starts with a really tight neck. I can't really turn it at some point and then I'll get ringing in my ears. And then the one where I know that I've gone too far is when I am not hungry anymore. Because I love food, so if I'm not hungry, that's like that's like with a sure sign that there's too much stress. So I would say for individuals, start to recognize what your signals are that tells your body you need a break. Um, and I don't recommend virtually co-working eight hours a day, but there, you know, you know, in and going in and out of offices. If you're a really social person, it can be a good solution for the Corona times. Because I think a lot of us are feeling a bit isolated. Even I am feeling a bit isolated here in my home office. So. Uh, Lizette, um, just for your presentation, there were um, a couple of questions from participants around um, the resolution of your slides that wasn't um, very high. So maybe you could share oh. your slides as a link in the chat later um, so yeah, that no people problem. can look it up. Um, and also you were using a software that a friend of mine has pitched to me. And uh, it allowed you to do some, our people said OBS for, um, uh, or self-service OBS. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about this uh, software? Yeah, I, I, you know, I saw a video for it somewhere. I can, people send me tools all the time. Like every day I get new tools because I've got the big list on my website. So everybody wants to it? be on the, on the list. Um, but this one, uh, this tool is called mm -hmm, which is a really weird name. It's M-M-H-M-M -M -M app. So it's called mm -hmm. And it just allows me to be a weather woman, you know, and then just show my slides on my, and I've lost my screen for where it is. Oh, here it is. So, you know, I can just, I can show my slides here. On, on it. So, you know, it's, you know, I can minimize it and move it around and I can show videos. And the reason why I like it so much is one, because it's way more engaging to see a person speak with their slides rather than just watching slides and listening to a voice. I, I, I've always hated that format. Um, uh, and the other thing is, I really believe that we have to change the way we present and communicate online to be more engaging. And tools like this just make it really easy. So there's maybe, another maybe one out there. This one's for Mac only. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, no problem. Maybe you can post the link in the chat later so that people can check it out. I th 100%. still think what you could tell their support is the resolution is improvable. <laughs> but uh, you'll Oh, yeah. I d I'm not sure what's happening there with the resolution because uh, my slides are professionally designed. And I promise when you get them, they'll have beautiful resolution. So sorry that they were a bit blurry. I'll have to look into that. But yeah. Oh, good. What I also liked a lot in the talk, so let me uh, give a shout out to our audience. We had uh, something like 500 people watching, and there were like 280 um, participating in your um, uh, polls, which I think is a pretty good um, participation rate. I don't know what your experiences are uh, with that, but I was very satisfied with that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what's normal exactly, but I think uh, the reason why those things are high is because the engagement is higher during presentations when you can see somebody. 
Mm-hmm. So I think because of the tool that I'm using, it, it it helps people pay more attention, and therefore you're get I get that's my theory. Uh, I would have I would really have to test that, but that's what I'm guessing. Because I don't think you know it's not like I'm the most interesting speaker in the world, but I think that this talk is more interesting because you can see me. One surprise was uh, you were uh, much earlier than we thought you were, and then we said, "Oh, turn the microphone off. What are we gonna do?" <laughs> Oh, we're, we're going to talk her into getting back into schedule. And actually, that worked. <laughs> so, so thank you. And thanks a lot, Kathy, for uh, bridging um, uh, the schedule gap. And thank you, <laughs> thank you. for being uh, such a nice person to speak to. We do have thank another you. session in the mainstream with Lisette at 6 p.m., I think. Um, you may have to check mm-hmm. out um, uh, the later uh, back with us. Um, but it's, it is 6 p.m., right? Yeah, 6 p.m. Um, and, yeah, and I will for say for any now. questions that uh, didn't get answered today, um, just let me know, Katie, what they are. I'll record the answer asynchronously and send that off to you guys. Oh, yeah. that's you a cool get those questions uh, offering. Answered. Thanks a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, we have to cut you two out to get some more housekeeping and the tracks going. And um, thanks a lot. See you later. Thank you, Lisa. 